I'm going to start out with a few charts about the growth of the internet, give some background on, on what the growth patterns look like in different aspects, and then talk a little bit about the effects of that. Up until just recently, there's been one major backbone that was applied by the National Science Foundation. So this is just the traffic that went across the National Science Foundation backbone network. Traffic that somehow got from here to there without touching the backbone network didn't get counted. So this is, this is only part of the traffic in the, in the internet. And in the last uh, measurement here, the traffic went down, and that's because the NSF backbone is being phased out, being replaced by commercial networks. So that we're not even going to have data in the future about how much traffic there is on the network. It's going to be all divided up into different commercial providers who don't really want to share that information. This is a, this is a view of, of what's called the messaging traffic. This is sort of like the email traffic, and this is. Now, so all these charts just show that everything goes up. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the point here. Um, this is one on the, uh, the growth of the World Wide Web. Gopher was a sort of text-oriented browsing service that would let you get into documents and had a, a text-oriented indexing system or hierarchy. And the, the web is a much more uh, attractive uh, visual-based system. And you can see that it basically was not very significant until about 19, the beginning of 94, and since then it's just grown tremendously. All these slides that I'm showing on these graphs are uh, prepared by the Internet Society. Just to give credit to them. Tony Rutkowski at the Internet Society basically developed these graphs. This is a, this is a little bit different idea. Here he took the uh, across the bottom, the GNP of the country, and plotted the number of hosts connected to the internet on the vertical axis and put down a point for each country. And one of the things we see is that, um, to, to some extent, the developed countries are above this line and the undeveloped countries are below the line. But there's some kind of weird exceptions. Um, it has to do with maybe how many, how much the internet has penetrated into the uh, population of the country. How many people have computers? on their own desk or at home uh, can have an effect on that because you see like Japan is a little below the line here. You would have thought that they were probably a fairly well developed country. So another, another graph here shows, uh, takes the number of computers across the bottom and the number of the amount of traffic sent, again this is across the NSF net, toward that country. So this shows more how, how those computers are used. So you may have a country that's, that sort of has lots of computers, and, uh, but if they don't use them very much, then they fall below the line on this group. Now I want to sort of move into the second part of my talk here and talk about sort of what the effects of all this are. So to talk about the way the internet grows by incorporating communities, something about how technology and how thresholds in technology affect Kind of things. A little bit about the internet culture and, and the, who the users are and, and what their attitudes are and, and how, what the implication of all that is for society. So, so one of the things is going back in the, the early days, the, the internet, you know, the networking, <coughs> was used primarily by computer scientists, scientists that developed it. And, and one of the things that we saw over and over again as other scientists became aware and begin to use the internet was that uh, a community of sciences, scientists would begin to use it to exchange information. And when sort of the, the percentage of that community got to a certain size, and it's a little hard to know what that size is, but I would guess about 20%, then suddenly everybody in that community had to use it to keep up. One of the things that happens, in, one of the ways science works is that people go off and they do their research and they write a paper and it gets published and other scientists know about it and they go off and do some research based on that or try to replicate the experiment and so on. And, and typically from the time you write the paper until it gets published in a journal is at least a year. When the internet came, became available, um, scientists would say, okay, I got my paper accepted by the journal, I will take a copy of that and make it available as a file on the internet, and people can get copies of it also, or I'll send it via email to my friends. So people were getting the preprints of the paper before they actually appeared in the journal, maybe six months or a year before it would ordinarily have been available. And what this did is increase the pace of science, so that so these geologists or the astronomers were all of a sudden sort of 
just cranking the crank up a lot faster so these places where there was a year delay between getting news of some experiment done out to the community that was just just now took that delay right out of the system and 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 it became important then if you wanted to keep up with the field to be in the community that had this advanced knowledge to the knowledge in advance so we just saw over and over again throughout the sciences that that it would be adopted in this way and that at some stage, when certain percentage of the people in that community had adopted internet technology, that it just became important, if you wanted to stay up with that field at all, to, to also adopt it. And so we've seen this go through in the sciences, and we saw government research in units that were involved with sponsoring those science activities got involved. And then another interesting thing is that the vendors of equipment to those science communities began to use the internet to do things like uh, support, whether it's, it's hardware or software, but do support so that if you were a scientist and you were using some particular piece of equipment, it became possible to send an email to your suppliers and say, hey, I'm having a problem with this piece of equipment. Do you know there's any, any fix for this little bug? And, and so that email or that internet access to uh, relationships between businesses and the users of their, of their products uh, began to develop. The other thing we saw is that with all these scientists were in universities, so that so they would start saying, well, how come I can't talk to the university administration the way I talk to my scientist friends in the other university? So universities basically had to adopt this stuff sort of throughout their university administration. So this sort of spreads by communities, but communities get larger as time goes by. And, that, and you just see this happening over and over again, that, that some, some area just sort of develops begins to use the internet and must sort of everybody in the community must adopt it. Another kind of thing that happens that we've seen over and over again is that there's sort of thresholds of technology. I think this happens a large effect is is driven by the fact that the communication resources in this country come in sort of large steps. Like you have dial-up lines that are up to maybe 10,000 bits a second, and then you start getting dedicated access lines that are 56 or 64 kilobits a second, and then you, the next step is really T1, which is one and a half megabits a second. And so you have these sort of major steps in the way that communications facilities, the raw facilities are provisioned. And this has a big effect on what kinds of applications and what kinds of things you can do. At fairly low speeds, you can do typing and email and file transfers and so on. But as the, as the, the number of bits involved in the thing that you want to transmit grows, it becomes more feasible to do that as the underlying speeds of the communication system increase. And right now, most of the internet, the backbones in the internet, are at the T3 speed, that's 45 megabits per second. And it sort of makes images like we use in the, in the World Wide Web just barely possible. And out at the edges of the, where people have dial-in lines or lower speed lines, it's really fairly painful to, to use those facilities. But as time goes by, we're going to have another generation of communication facilities, and we'll be able to move into, into motion video and movies, probably, probably motion video in about three years, and, and maybe sort of movie quality video probably in about 10 years. Because what's going to happen is we're going to have to take these steps in provisioning the network. And sort of the people that do this aren't really prepared to do it every day. I mean, you need to have some time to get your facilities in place. We've gone through the, the phase of getting T3 lines in place pretty much throughout the uh, backbones of the network. And it'll probably be about three years before the people are, that, that actually do this work are ready to, to sort of turn the crank and go through again. But then we'll probably go to something like 600 megabits a second. So, so these are sort of big steps that happen, and they enable new technologies. And I basically don't think that something like a World Wide Web could have been successful until most of the people that are using it were in a university world that had access to at least T1 lines. And before the, before we had that speed in the network, I don't think an application like that could have been a success. So there, there are these effects of the technology on what kind of applications 